Welcome. This is the Punk CX Podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm an advisor, best-selling author, Forbes contributor, and general explorer of the service and experience space. On the podcast, I seek out and interview entrepreneurs, leading business people, authors, tech leaders, academics, and generally cool people doing interesting stuff in the service and experience space. Check out the archive at adrianswinsko.com. That's enough from me. Let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Punk CX Podcast. With me today, I have Prashant Huria, who is the VP and CTO of Distributive Trade at Unilever. Hey, Prashant, how are you doing? Very well. Thank you for having me, Adrian. You're very welcome. Now, Prashant, for the for people that don't know your name, don't know the, what Distributive Trade is about, not familiar with that sort of like that sort of space, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and also the work that you do? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, my name is Prashant Uriya. So I'm uh, I'm the chief technology officer for our distributive trade business across Unilever. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur at heart and deeply passionate about leveraging technology and power of data and analytics to solve real world challenging problems and have an impact on the lives of millions of people, whether it's in the industry I am in or my or previous industries. My background is early stage growth software startups, consulting and consumer goods sector before I joined Biopharma in sort of 2009. Um, I left Zeninka in 2019 as their acting CIO there, where I contributed heavily to its turnaround and transformation over 10 years and turned sort of science fiction into science facts, so to speak. Since then, I held I helped a public software company turn around where they went private and have been advising other software startups. So all in all, over 20, around 25 years experience and track record in driving large scale business change through leading technology at multinational companies with expertise of sort of you know, building and leading talented teams spanning all of product management, design, user research, platforms, data science, software engineering, and AI, uh, absolutely in what, what I've been doing. So... That's sort of my background, and w- what I'm doing here um, in in distributive trade is is really about building this EB two B platform business where we are digitally where we are digitizing the entire value chain of our uh, distributed trade business. Perfect. So super excited to be sharing progress and learnings here. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think we'll get into that in in a. In a, in a, in a minute because I think it's a fabulous story because we you I was able to I was privy to the story or was not exclusively obviously but there was a whole bunch of other people in the room because we met at the uh, the recent Adobe Summit in Las Vegas and I listened to your presentation we were going to record the podcast there but we didn't have a chance because it was just run out of time and things and hence we're rescheduling it here but I wanted to say great job on the presentation because I thought it was a fantastic story which we'll learn more about at um, in a minute, but also congratulations on winning the Experience Maker of the Year Award, which is sort of a testament to all that you've kind of like you've been kind of doing. So preamble kind of like aside or well, preamble over, can you tell me a little bit more about what you've been up to with the distributive trade in terms of what you've been working on, what it's been and and the sort of impact it's had and how it's kind of and it, what led you to get nominated for the award? Obviously, it's not just about the award, but the awards are nice cherry as it were but tell me about what you've been up to with the distributive trade because i think it's a fantastic story yeah i mean uh thank you for that i i was nominated for the award because of frankly the hard work that's been done at unilever to drive a really unique and impactful <laughs> program on dig, you know digitizing the distributive trade and its rollout over the past few years of course it was an honor to win the experience maker of the year for the commercial growth in the the DDT sort of the digitization of distributed trade is driving for Unilever alongside the collaborations with various partners to deploy this world class technology. You know, Unilever launched a major modernization project with Adobe Commerce to broaden our reach with small and medium sized organizations and expand its distributed trade business. The initial rollout of the project led to a, a over sort of 20% rise in gross sales and a near 20% jump in average order value. So it is it has been having an impact across 
there are uh, markets that are that we are focused on across dis- distributive trade. Fantastic. Now, for the benefit of, I mean, I guess for our leaders, I mean, uh, so I understand what you mean by the distributive trade because I spent, I have some familiarity with some of the businesses that owner and the businesses and the business owners that you're talking about because I spent about ooh about six years across the 1990s living in Cairo and Egypt and I'm familiar with some of these businesses, but can you tell me when you you talk about distributive trade? Can you tell me what sort of businesses we're actually kind of like kind of dealing with here, just to kind of like um, to give the listeners a better idea of what we're what we're dealing with here? Because that's what I mean. And a lot of times when I speak to people, people are talking about B two B B two C stories, big consumer brands, all these different things. It's all the stuff that they do. Or then they're going to be talking about oh B two B sort of like stuff, which is into maybe. It might be technology based. It might be SaaS technology. It might be manufacturing. It might be all sorts of different things. Um, but this is a very, very specific kind of like layer. Like you talked about the E to B to C type of um, idea. But paint me a picture of what sort of businesses we're we're dealing with kind of here, because I think that's the kind of thing that's going to be, that's going to bring it to life. And it, it did bring it to life to me when I kind of listened to the story and I thought, oh, I know that. I've shopped in some of those kind of places. Yeah. They're great. Yeah, no, I, I I totally appreciate that. I mean, in consumer packaged goods, companies like Unilever, you know, who obviously we go from, we have to go from manufacturer, manufacturing the products all the way to the final consumers, which encompasses the stages between production and purchase, right? So we have wholesalers, we have distributors, so similar to wholesalers, but distributors act as intermediaries between manufacturers and retailers. They may also provide additional services like storage, transportation, and you know marketing support. And then you have the retailers, obviously, the, uh, who mm-hmm. um, sell our products and other CPG products directly to consumers. And these are the grocery stores, the convenience stores, the department stores. You know, basically, here we are specifically talking about the mom and pop stores, it's like the corner shop stores, right? The convenience stores, the corner shop stores, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I think that's the thing. I, I um, if anybody's, and this is across markets that you might not, it might not, it's not necessarily the markets you would. It's not necessarily European markets or North American markets. As you were talking about, you're based in Singapore, and so yeah, a lot of the markets you're you're um, you're focusing on right now are across Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia, Indian continent, reaching into kind of like Middle East, Africa. That those sort of there is where many of these kind of these okay. stores are. Okay, and also Latin, also Latin America, Adrian. You know, like exactly Latin America. Um, yeah, and I think that the, well, the thing that kind of struck me about it, and so if you've anybody's been to these um, any of these kind of countries or traveled around or lived at all in these countries or are a resident in these kind of countries, they will be absolutely familiar with these kind of like small retailers that are a crucial part of that sort of social fabric and the workings of these kind of like, you know, local economies. But the thing that struck me was that um, you were telling me about the story and you talked about how you'd got, I'm sure the number's gone up since then, but you've been able to get 2.7 million of these stores onto this new platform that you've built. And I'm a bit like, what? I'm like, going, blimey, yeah. how good well, one, how long did that take and how did you do it? Yeah, I, so f- first of all, I, I think Unilever has been, you know, it's a, one of the strengths of Unilever is really in the fragmented trade or the distributive trade. So we've been, we've been there for decades, for a very long time. That isn't new. However, the approach is using technology to connect with these mom and pop stores directly really took off during the pandemic as a way to get products to customers time that channel strategies had to shift right? right so you know when it comes to getting our products to our customers we made broad um, strides towards using the digital solutions to make the platform effectively more effective so let me give you a few examples to bring this to life you know digitalizing in-store tracking in modern trade outlets such as sure. supermarkets using artificial intelligence to inform our portfolio design for different Mm -hmm. channels, optimizing our investment with retail media. So, you know, we're doing 
quite a lot of thing around transforming digitally. You know, the whole of Unilever. It's uh, and of course our, our our customers. In terms of the number that you gave, yeah, we've digitized. You know, north of two 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 point seven million stores in total, and have brought everyone along the journey with us. So we started a journey with the customer, which in distributive trade is a small and fragmented mom and pop retailer that we just spoke about. And there are millions of these in outlets in, in countries and are often scattered in rural areas. Of course, they're in urban areas, but they're yeah. also in rural areas. And they are the backbone of their <clears throat> communities and families, providing daily necessities to those living in the proximity while providing an additional income street, uh, stream. So there are a lot of benefits of digitizing to uh, digitization to, to these retailers, to our customers. And we serve yeah. them through a network of distributors, business partners that effectively sell Unilever products to these retailers, as I was saying earlier. And we provide a range of services. So, you know, fulfillment, order capture, advisory, and so on. Uh, but also there's a, a, a big element of efficiency and convenience. Mm -hmm. So now the retailers can engage in digital trade from their shop anywhere, anytime. And online platforms are not new, uh, but streamlining the the, uh, the purchase process of our retailers allows them uh, for quick mm -hmm. transactions you know reduce paperwork and minimum minimal physical effort not just for the retailers but also for the for the distributors supplying these these products and the platform provides the retailers then the visibility into Unilever products available and uses the near real time or real time data analytics to personalize the recommendations and promotions and provide this end-to-end -end visibility to their purchase and delivery status, delivering a new and exciting experience for our retailers. So you could argue, well, isn't this Amazon for B2B? Well, right. yes. And it has not been done in the distributive trade business at the scale and the sophistication, but also the simplification at which we need to do. Uh, so that's the really I think that's exciting thing in the change. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's going to think because so I think for me, it was interesting is that you kind of, it's applying what is, when you talk about the personalization, you talk about the the uh, recommendations, you talk about being able to do order tracking, you uh, uh, all the account management, all these different sort of things. It it feels like you've brought a lot of things that are you'd be quite common in a B2B, a modern B2B, B2C space, but is now increasingly entering the B2B space, but you bring it to a sector or to a space that has traditionally not necessarily been focused on and has been quite low tech in, 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 in kind of like nature. Spot on. And I think it's, and I think the thing that, that um, we were talking before and you, in a, and it reminded me of something that, that the idea that when you talk about convenience, you're going, well, if anybody knows the, the convenience store, or the corner shop, or the small retail sort of mom and pop store space, particularly, or well, or even have a some have some insight into it. They know that actually these business owners they do everything. They will gonna go at some points. They will end up kind of going off to the kind of the wholesaler and go around and fill up their car with a whole bunch of things and come back with a car completely stacked yeah. and then have to ship it all out into the shop and then restock the things and put stuff in the, in the, in the storeroom and all this, all that sort of like stuff. And so, and that takes a lot of effort and being able to do that, you know, uh, on a regular kind of basis. And so the idea that you can all have that done automatically and have that tracked and have it managed and things, I think is, is brilliant. And, but, but the fact that you've been able to shift so many people onto it, I think onto the platform to be able to do that is, is kind of brilliant. And, I mean, so how many different markets are we talking about right now? How many, how many, these 2.7 million people are, the, how many markets is it, is it distributed kind of across? And, and then is the platform then customized for them by language? Yeah. So we've uh, configured uh, the platform to cater to do many market specific requirements. One of this is local languages, obviously Thai, Vietnamese, and so on, uh, in addition to English. And we also ensure adherence to all the local fiscal and regulatory requirements in the markets that we've rolled the, the platform out to. In, in, in terms of where the platform is, so the, the initial rollout, of course, through the pandemic times, you know, was to basically to almost every market had an app, you know, provided to the, to the retailer. 
but this platform approach that uh, we've taken o- over the last you know uh, 18 months or so 12 to 18 months i think that, that entire platform that we are focusing it in waves so the first wave has around uh, you know seven markets around southeast asia south asia and 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 turkey plus a couple of uh, latin american markets so that's where really the okay focus is and then there will be other waves following that okay and um I just wanted to think about one then to ask about because this feels like because I know that Unilever has been in this sort of like disputive sort of trade space for a while and then I've had to continually adapt as you say you've been in this place for decades and and adapt some of their bigger retailer products um to be able to fit with this kind of market the different customer kind of like demands and so you've always been Unilever's always been paid attention to this market, but then also adapted to this market to kind of meet the kind of customer kind of needs over there. But the this technological kind of platform approach is kind of different. It feels different for Unilever. And I just wondered, how has Unilever and all of your network had to sort of change in order to kind of get to this kind of like kind of point? Because it feels like going, oh, you're not longer no longer just a CPG kind of company. You now feel like a, oh, you need to act like a technology company. And so, what have you? What have been some of the big sort of changes and challenges that Unilever's had to face in order to be able to realize this? Yeah, I think it's a it's a really it's a really good question. And uh, when you think about as an example, I think if you think about the the loyalty space within this, so you know how do you drive adoption and how do you drive the, sort of the B2B loyalty, which is very different from a B2C context. So we've customized a retailer loyalty program, setting a new standard in mm-hmm. in B2B focused loyalty capability for distributive trade. You know, we've of course drawn basics yeah. from the B2C context, such as tier structure, which rewards retailers based on their level of engagement, uh, incentivizing ongoing participation and fostering deeper relationships but also recognizing that retailers come in all shapes and sizes. We've had to personalize the experience by implementing point earning rules that vary based on the size of retailers' baskets, including brands, categories, et cetera. And this this better aligns then incentives to both the desired and realistic behavior among retailers, driving engagement and fostering loyalty. And and we're getting data all the time in terms of the retailer behavior of of course, there are other features such as free goods, samples, coalition loyalty, and gamification rewards, which we will continue to develop and roll out. But the important thing is the role of uh, the, by, by cultivating these lasting relationships with our retailers. You know, we build the mm-hmm. trust and retention, also helping to, of course, fend off potential competitors. And the idea is the is the best of the distributor sales reps you know, then really playing a supporting role to really expand the business and bring in new ideas for the retailers and the retailers having this convenience to be able to order at any time at their convenience anywhere. And so you just, you mentioned them there, the sales reps. I mean, like, so how is their role changed? So there's like, it's not just about a catalog and a whole bunch of new products and deals and and promos and things. I mean, it's like, or, it probably is, but it's also kind of so much more now because it's like very much technology led as well. Yeah. So how's their role changed? Look, look that was really something we had to think through. Unilever has eight thousand distributors, uh, and you know mm-hmm. over fifty thousand sales reps globally. Today, the role of our sales rep is focused on routine order taking and stock replenishment for the retailer. Okay. Um, yeah. simplifying. Mm-hmm. Of course, they have uh, ultimately, they've been there for decades and they have a, or some for many years, some for decades, and they have a very strong relationship with those uh, retailers, right? Those mom and pop stores. Um, but with the platform and its data and analytics capability, uh, the goal is to evolve their role to be more like category advisors, helping recommend the best right. and most relevant products for the different retailers based on their size, category, location, other parameters and aspects. And through the this converged experience, 
between the retailer and the sales reps. The sales reps have now the visibility to retailer cart, and they can communicate the right offers applicable to retailer only orders. So thereby building more trust mm-hmm. and drive greater adoption of the platform. And for this to be possible, you know, yeah. we need to slowly manage the change for the sales rep, as you pointed out, starting by building trust and adoption in the platform. You know, the benefits to them, the benefits to the retailer, overall benefits, and over time, educating them on the features and how it will benefit their day-to-day jobs so that they move away from the mundane sort of order taking to real demand capture and this category advisor to grow uh, the business. Uh, first, of course, of the retailers and by doing so, you know, of Unilever. So it's a, it's a real uh, win-win. And this is an absolute distributor inclusive model that that we had to roll out. Yeah, no, because it feels like they, you know, as you say, they're 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 they have these relationships, and but it seems like there's a fundamental kind of like kind of change where because like you you talked about some of these these mom and pop stores, and um, now many of them might have phones or smartphones, and they may be using it for various different kind of like you know different kind of reasons, but many of them may not be as or may not be that digitally literate. They may have just like a a regular phone and and may not um, be on all these different sort of like four um, G, five G enabled sort of platforms. And like, so, I guess there there is also a bit of a a technology maturity, digital literacy, education sort of like kind of thing, which is. Again, it's going to. It's, I guess it's going to change the sort of time dynamic in in those in those sort of like relationships because I remember, and it probably hasn't changed that much. I remember kind of when when a sales rep kind of came on. And it was a sales sales rep came and it was boom boom, and you were there for like 15, 20 minutes, and then you're on to the next one because it's like yeah. it's it's all about time. It's like going, no, get out of my way. It's like I've got people to serve and the thing. So that's. Take making the time to actually do that education. That, I mean, that feels like a, a very, very um, a bigger challenge, different challenge. Um, and so, yeah, I can. I mean, was that did that go smoothly, or was there a little bit of like, oh, we have to kind of work with the sales reps in order to get that help them to to bring them on the journey with you. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> I think there was a there was an enormous uh, you know uh, set of learnings and a huge learning curve that we had to go through. Our end markets had to go through, and remember, we haven't touched these systems that we are effectively replacing for you know more than a decade. Maybe in some cases, yeah, around fifteen years. You know, we haven't touched these systems. And we are putting a modern platform based on modern technologies, mm-hmm. uh, very strong foundation and architecture, which has to be low cost, you know, has to be um, totally scalable, has to perform really, really well in in areas where the network is inconsistent and you have no mm-hmm. control over what what phones the retailers have. You do have some level of influence over the distributor sales reps uh, devices that you can provide guidelines and we can influence them a bit, but our retailers, we don't. And so the performance can vary. So you have to almost design it for the, you know, the lowest common denominator and it has to be at a scale and the change management, you know, across the multiple activity systems that you're trying to integrate is also enormous. So at different levels, first, you're trying to integrate demand capture with demand generation, demand fulfillment, credits and payments, all the way to, you know, integrated customer support and digital adoption. So all of these major activity systems, you're integrating those. You you are then, you know, having to, in, in, in many cases, the business models, uh, the micro business model, at a high level is the same business model, but at micro level, you know, you have, in some countries, you have van sales. In other countries, you know, you have Kelly sales in addition to the sales reps from the distributors mm-hmm. and, you know, WhatsApp channels, et cetera. All of these have to be studied and integrated in the right way. And you need to have the right service mix, which makes sense. You then have multiple businesses, the way the beauty products serves the, the, the you know, the, the customer base and the cohorts. 
is slightly different in terms of you know the the, the way they go to market the the you know from my stream to which is cold chain primarily the, and a different dedicated set of distributors to you know home care and personal care so there's that level of obviously complexity in in how you actually scale fast all of the distributors and then you have another level of complexity which is the the retailer unassisted self ordering themselves and then of course you need to bring first and most importantly the sales rep onto that the distributors basically onto that journey and one of the learnings for example was mm-hmm. you've got to pick your best distributor in the beginning not the worst one you also have to pick multiple distributors one in a sort of more urban area and one in a rural area so you've got to get that right you also have to think about the change management from a perspective of starting with uh, two distributors really getting that done well and making sure they meet the action standards of incremental turnover or average order value or an assist self ordering whatever our kpis are and then you scale fast and uh, you know so there's a there, there are multiple layers of you know complexities right. that have to go that have to go into a, a real comprehensive integrated change plan and the most important thing in all of this is there are going to be issues but how quickly you respond to it i think is going to be very important and and one of the ways that we've been able to do that to be honest we've we've organized ourselves completely as as a product led organization so customer focused product led organization which means that we have squads around these activity systems and you know right. everybody is behind the leader and making sure that that you have you you have all the people from technology platform data and analytics um you know the the business process experts and the market success leaders all working with the local market closely but also have one foot on the ground working directly with the sales rep of the distributors as well as the retailers so that gives you the agility because you have closed loop feedback you don't have to wait for some nps survey done 6 months down the line you know you're there every single day you and and the, that that feedback's working so there's a lot going on there for this comprehensive change plan to land this yeah no i think it's it, i mean that, that yeah there is a lot going on but i mean i, I think it, that that really paints a, a picture of how you've been able to do that i mean one final question on this is like give me a can you give me a sense of the um what has been the, the what has been the benefit for the business i mean what's been the commercial impact of the whole platform on can kind of you unilever if you can talk to that of course i mean you might can turn around and go, mm, that's our that's for us to know and you to find out yeah well uh, look broad brush i i, I think y- y- you know the distributed trade as i said earlier is obviously very critical to unilever uh, we have a strong foothold and it contributes more than 13 billion euros in sales primarily in emerging markets and developing markets like we point to southeast asian markets india you know mm-hmm. unilever has the as i was mentioning earlier over 50000 sales rep globally over 8000 distributors the global eb2b market is projected to grow at you know depending on which survey you 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 look at from accenture to mckinsey to others around 15 to 16% between 15 to 16% per annum between 2021 and 2028 you even launched as an example shikhar an end to end digitized solution for our distributive trade channel focusing on the entire value chain and the shikhar app is today enabling millions of small scale retailers in india to go digital um, driving a retailer centric revolution at uh, unilever uh, no one's been able to do that across india it allows the store owners to directly connect with hindustan unilever sellers to place orders 24/7 with quick and assured last mile delivery but it goes much further you know it helps stores optimize inventory store owners can make payments online there's free delivery within 24 hours in in many areas it improves the whole demand capture fulfillment customer service as i was mentioning earlier the it provides pretty accurate assortment recommendations and access also to credit to grow their business so the power is now in the hands of these kirana store owners right and so yeah i think you know commercially definitely it's 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 having an impact and will continue to do so yeah i think so i think that for me the impact is it, it is on different kind of levels one is for 
Unilever at a macro level, but it also, which is a great thing to to see, is like, you know, you can have that win-win situation. You do something which is that matters to Unilever, but you do something which is really matters and has a significant positive impact to the retailers as well. And so I think that's kind of great. So one final thing is like, um, what's next, Prashant? World domination? Well, no, not quite. I, I think we we are uh, quite a <laughs> quite a humble company in that sense. I think you know the platform is now the new platform is now live in three markets in Southeast Asia. Aspiration is to complete the rollout to our largest markets mm-hmm. and focus markets across Southeast Asia, South Asia, and also the change of change of our platform in 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 uh, Brazil. All by end of twenty twenty five. My hope and aspiration is that given the success of the platform and what we've seen so far, I think that that could even happen sooner. And through this platform, you know, we hope to drive end-to-end transformation of the distributive trade value chain, uplifting the retailer experience and driving sustainable growth uh, for Unilever. So that's really what's next. Nice. And so a couple of quick fire questions before we can like wrap up. Now, I know that we've talked about lots of different things. And we sort of and I always like to have a bit of a rummage around this the mm. these sort of stuff on on these these interviews. But given we talked about a whole broad range of things, I also like people to boil it down into for to actionable advice. And what I've been asking people to do re- recently is to complete this sentence. So it Here's the sentence I would like you to complete. If you want to improve your customer employee experience, Prashant Huria says, do this, dot, dot, dot. (laughs) Over to you, Prashant. Complete that sentence. Um, Train your team to listen like ninjas and care like champions. You know, happy employees create happy customers. It's that simple. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I could could add that. (laughs) I could add to that, sorry. (laughs) But yes. That's, I mean, you know, empathy is your superpower, I would say. And a and, and couple of other things, if I may, I think, you know, of I, course. I would say, don't just ask for customer and employee feedback. You know, I would say really devour it. I mean, you know, gather that gold and use it to make real improvements. So, you know, feedback gold mine, I think, shouldn't be underestimated. And metrics that really matter. Numbers don't lie, but also... Mm-hmm. you know, go and talk to the customers. Strategy is not what happens on a piece of paper. It's actually what's on the ground, what's happening. So I would say stop, listen, act is is the good old advice, which I think we should yeah. we should uh, absolutely have. Fantastic. And and keep, keep tweaking. Fantastic. Keep learning. Absolutely. So that's brilliant. So the second thing is, now this is the Punk CX podcast, and therefore I have to ask you a punk-related Kind of question I wrote kind of two books around this punk theme. One was Punk CX, and the follow up was Punk XL. <laughs> um, and XL stands for experience, sort of lead leadership. So, mm. so Prashant, which can I ask you to kind of like have a think about what kind of company or brand do you think is taking a more who's it, who's an experienced leader who's got it all knitted together? You think I think they're definitely one that. We should pay attention to because they're doing us a lot of cool stuff and there's a lot to be learned from them. Look, honestly, there are many that come to mind. Obviously, I've not worked for them, so I don't know behind the scenes what's happening completely. But one, of course, we know because we uh, they were part of Unilever. I think um, one I would say is Zappos. I'm not sure right. if you've heard of them. Yeah, um, no, I know Zappos. So I think they're... they're they have an unconventional approach, it appears, and very customer centric. So, you know, this their focus on this employee happiness and also empowered employees, where they have the go extra mile for customers, fostering kind of a, this wow experience that breaks away from sort of scripted interactions. But also this kind of unconventional approach, you know, from their sort of legendary thousand day return policy to their focus on building relationships. So they just. They defy sort of industry norms and they sort of string it together. That's one. And then besides that, to be honest, you know, the one that I'm really impressed also with, I have to say, is uh, the Lego group. Uh, You know, really, really impressed with just following what they've been doing with their commitment to user-generated content, 
co-creation with fans that shows a willingness to break away from traditional brand customer dynamics and how they're digitally transforming themselves as well. Perfect. Love them. Um, and so my final question now, I've been asking this because I find like I'm doom scrolling every morning when I'm drinking my cup of coffee. And so I'm always asking kind of, I've asked, started asking people at the end of these conversations is like, push on. Give me a good news story. Like, tell me something that you've seen that you think that's made you smile in the last sort of week. You think, oh, that's cool. I saw that. And it's like, they, that's a good news story. It made me smile. So yeah. let's finish on a good news story. Yeah, I I, I think um, I have actually maybe two or three. Let me start with one, which is, uh, if I may, just on the, you know, close to sort of maybe what, what, what I'm seeing at work and what I'm doing. And then one maybe... Uh, uh, you know, outside very quickly. So we, we have a product called Intelligent Quotient. So, you know, we've embarked on a journey where we basically use advanced and cutting edge tech for the we, what we were discussing earlier with sales rep and retailer recommendations mm-hmm. using sort of, uh, you know, neural networks. And they're computational models which mimic like, you know, the complex functions of the human brain. The, the, the They work on a human brain work on sort of neurons and neural networks work with artificial neurons that process and learn from data, as you know, from image recognition, pattern recognition, et cetera. So with this advanced modeling, we are able to predict what the retailer would buy, making the sales reps job faster and efficient, because imagine you have, you know, hundreds of SKUs to, to, to recommend from, and it will also help them cover more outlets and target assortment growth and so on. So we recommend today 150 million plus recommendations and 450 plus models that are currently running every single month. And so with this new innovation around neural, we foresee an increase in a hit rate, you know, at least 10 to 12%, making our recommendation sharper and relevant. So that was something really cool that I, you know, the team has been uh, working on. I thought that that's quite uh, positive. But the external story, which I find exceptionally mind-boggling and inspiring, is the chip trip from sort of Hajar to mind-blowing AI with NVIDIA. You know, so forget those funky calculators, you know, where we were cramming billions of transistors on a fingernail-sized chip. And uh, sort of NVIDIA in the 90s with the GPUs, uh, you know, it's sort of math ninjas perfect for the booming world of AI. And now you are into even 25 times faster NVIDIA's latest Blackwell chips, which are 25 times more energy efficient than ever before, processing AI tasks at lightning speed. I just, I'm finding this entire trillion parameter models that they are now able to work on. And just imagine the real world impact of this on self-driving cars, on AI-powered art and music, on medical breakthroughs. I I just find it mind-boggling. And linked to that is someone sent me a video of something that, you know, it came out of the Google Research Labs where someone is walking with the the app, literally pointing at images and, and talking to that assistant and that assistant's describing what they are seeing, the emotions, uh, across a multitude of use cases, uh, and I'm certain it's it's the combination, and you know, obviously not just generated AI, but also the power of these very powerful chips that are helping to run it. So the future of AI really is mind-bendingly awesome, and you know, I think we all need to get ready for a world powered by tiny, super intelligent chips. <laughs> well, that's. Um, that's brilliant. And I love it. Two kind of different stories, one an internal one, one an external one. So thank you for sharing that. And so I just want to say, that's it, Prashant. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to say congratulations on one, the Experience Maker Award at the Adobe Summit. Two, without doubt, for what you've achieved with the, uh, you and your team have achieved with the, 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 the dispute of kind of trade, kind of platform, I think it's awesome. And uh, and the number of people, it's a number of mom and pop stores. It's kind of touching and 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 helping change and delivering real kind of significant impacts to it. But but also just thank you for sharing your time and your insight and your experience with me today. That's been awesome. Brilliant. Thank you so much for for having me and your insightful questions. Really appreciate it. Thank you.
Wow, what a great interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Find out more about me and the work that I do at adrianswinsco.com. Do leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you have any comments, feedback, or questions about the podcast, then feel free to send me a message to podcast at adrianswinsco.com. And do tune in again. Thanks very much.